they, more than anyone else, brought the field of chemical biology to where it is today. They're luminaries in a discipline that, frankly, when I started out in science, didn't really exist. They were responsible for creating the field. Both of them are visionaries, and both of them at some times dragged the field of chemistry kicking and screaming into the future. They train a way of thinking about science and how to think about chemistry in biology. They were unwilling to just assume the natural world of biology to be the end of chemistry. And that's the revolution that they both have contributed to from opposite ends of the country in ways that have been competitive, yet in ways that have moved the horizon. They are the center of this huge area of science. I teach about their work in multiple classes, including a, cl a class on how do you commercialize uh, technologies in biotech. And while I was in the Schreiber lab, I just wouldn't be where I am today without both of them. I've, I've often wondered, you know, what if one of them existed and the other one didn't? What would chemical biology look like? Um, and I'm glad I don't have to, have to live in that world. You know, Pete and Stuart are remarkably successful as individual scientists but they've also both left legacies of institutional transformation, accelerating science, enabling researchers, and of course, how to fund the whole enterprise. Making sure that science has a home for the next hundred years. The funny thing about the two of us coming together in, in Houston under this very happy circumstances is that we came up at the same time and we were always on parallel tracks. Stuart and I started our careers at the same time and when you'd see Stuart give a talk, I'd say, damn, I wish I'd done that, <laughs> okay. And hopefully he thought the same about me. I, I've heard the, ta the phrase, the, the East Coast versus the West Coast. <laughs> and we always thought that to be very funny because we were foes in the sense of trying our own ways to have a, a big impact, but friends. That was good in my career, having kind of Stuart on the East Coast and me on the West Coast, because, you know, you would look at the science that the other person's doing and go, wow, that's really important and exciting, so maybe I should see if I can top it, okay? To be successful here, you really need to have inspirational figures and Peak from day one has always been that for me. As chemist, folks like myself and Stuart looked at biology as kinds of a kids in a candy store, and I think we both pretty much self-taught ourselves biology. It was kind of a transition period in how chemists thought from using biology to inspire new chemistry to using chemistry to probe and control biology. And you're looking at proteins, which are basically the machines that make all of life possible, right? And as a chemist, when you look at what proteins are made of, 20 building blocks, like half of them are grease. How can you make life from these very simple chemistries? What if we could make new building blocks that are more interesting and put those in the genetic code? So that's what we did. It was a pretty audacious uh, objective to see if he could expand the genetic code and those early papers led to studies in protein engineering, protein evolution that kick-started those fields and many of Schultz's students became the leaders as they took those ideas off on their own. The expansion of the genetic code beyond the 20 canonical amino acids fundamentally advanced our understanding of biology and enabled new therapeutic strategies and new ways to engineer proteins. Rewrote the central dogma of, of four bases make DNA and 20 amino acids make proteins to we could begin to put anything in we want. So the discovery of molecular glues was completely by chance. I was interested in two complex organic molecules, FK506 and cyclosporin, 
figured if we could understand the proteins these molecules bind, that might give us a clue of the mystery of signal transduction from the membrane into the nucleus of a cell. But as we began to explore further what the consequence of binding was, it became clear these chemicals were not binding just one, but two different proteins. And it was a moment in, in a lab meeting, and I said, these molecules are like glues. They're like molecular glues. They induce a proximal relationship of two different proteins. It was very exciting to me as a chemist because it's a very basic physical organic chemistry principle that when you pull two things together, induce proximity, you increase the rate of chemistry that might take place between them. So that was the initial discovery. Shortly thereafter, I studied a, another natural product called rapamycin. And lo and behold, rapamycin was a molecular glue and had a different consequence and effect in cells. The entire field of molecular glues, heterobifunctionals, dates back to uh, Stewart's pioneering work with the FK506 and rapamycin and other natural products, which led to the discovery of molecules that seem like science fiction. He wanted to think about, this is going to be useful to society. How can you impact the lives of patients? The first applications were in cancer, but new applications of rapamycin as a medicine emerged. We thought, we need to generalize this molecular glue phenomenon. And we devised a way to take any signaling protein and fuse it genetically and induce proximal relationships. And over and over and over, one cellular process after another, we learned we could commandeer with these chemical inducers of proximity. The nonprofit research institute business model is broken. How can we most efficiently take biomedical discoveries and translate them into new medicines? And that's the basis of three of my colleagues, uh, David Altshuler, Eric Lander, and Todd Golub and I, um, around 2003, forming the Broad Institute. Him helping to found the Broad made it much more obvious that chemistry and biology can be beautifully integrated. The Broad is beautiful because it's so collaborative and they're one of the first to put so many computational resources into chemistry and biology. Part of what was accomplished in that time was the building of a repurposable pipeline that we can now take new concepts, pair them with existing infrastructure and get answers faster. This idea of creating a new business model where you actually go from a discovery to a drug candidate internally accelerates the whole process from discovery to patient impact. A lot of people talk about bench to bedside, but you know, I, I would say Pete almost invented that in an academic setting. I think pairing Caliber with, with scripts, uh, it's a brilliant idea. Do you know that if you discovered enough drugs, they would fund the institution forever and it would be poured back into science. So all of a sudden you have a new source of revenues that you put back into the institute that allow you to now do research without the constraints of the NIH and federal funding. With a colleague, uh, Kevin Kinsella, in the late 80s, we formed a company called Vertex Pharmaceuticals. We decided that we would take on uh, an untreatable, unmanageable disease at the time called cystic fibrosis. And ultimately, new medicines emerged that make cystic fibrosis a manageable disease. However, it took us 30 years to go from the beginning of Vertex to life-changing life -changing drugs. And Arena Bioworks is aiming to build an environment where you could make those biological discoveries and you could translate them to medicines under one roof. Hopefully not in 30 years, but more like three years. This idea of making drugs, it's, it's kind of addictive. Both the challenge of it and also kind of the sense of accomplishment when you get there. At Caliber Skaggs, we've been able to build all of these platforms over decades that are now beginning to show impacts on patients in the clinic. 
We work in cancer, we work in infectious disease, we work in metabolic disease, we work in almost every area. We put 13 programs in the clinic and starting four new clinical trials this year. And that's where having these institutes like Caliber Arena, where problems that may require more persistence to solve, have a home. Their independent yet parallel efforts fundamentally defined and advanced chemical biology, forever shaping how researchers discover life-changing therapeutics. Congratulations to both of them for epochal contributions to our knowledge of chemistry and biology and to the furtherance of human good through the application of science.